Church, I know for a fact that there is a God. I know it, not just because of what he has said in his word, but how he is actively involved in this world and specifically in my life. I say that because this morning we're uh, finishing out the last part of Romans chapter 8. We're going all the, all the way through the end of the chapter to, to verse 39. And the title of this message is Guaranteed We Win. Now, I thought about renaming the, the message a little bit, something along the lines of, wait for it. You ever seen those parts in a movie where, um, I remember specifically, I, th I think, uh, is it Force 10 from Navarone? Uh, remember that movie, that great war movie? They have a, um, a, a, a river dam they have to destroy that has to take out a bridge. If I've got the wrong movie, please forgive me. I just see it on reruns, you know, way back in the past. But anyway, it's a great flick. Go look at it sometime. Uh, Harrison Ford's even in, in it, I believe. Um, but they have to destroy a dam to let all this water grow through to, to get rid of a bridge because the explosives they have aren't enough to take out the bridge. You know, the, it's, they have to take out the bridge so the Germans don't get through to destroy the Allies. And they place these explosives inside the, the uh, structure of, the, of the, the dam and whatnot at the very bottom. It goes off and nothing happens. And the two Americans that are in there are saying, when I get my hands on the, our guy who told us to do this, I'm going to wring his neck. So it's almost one of those moments where the language hasn't been put to it yet, but they're saying, no, wait for it. Because back up on uh, the shore, way down, uh, they can still see the structure and whatnot. And one of the guys with the explosive vectors, he says, nothing. That all, we went through all that and nothing. And the, and the, and the explosive expert is sitting there just, I think he's French. He might be smoking a cigarette or something like that. And he says, you know, hey, just take it easy. Let's give it a little bit of time. It's a little bitty box of dynamite and a big structure. You know, it's coming. And sure enough, the next few moments in the movie, suddenly cracks start to form in this dam. And all of a sudden, water starts to pour through. And sure enough, boom, the whole thing is gone. Scripture this morning, church, is almost encouraging us and talking to us and saying, wait for it. Guaranteed, we win. And I know for a fact there is a God who is in this world and he's involved in our lives because I ran across a brand new song by the gentleman in the name of David, uh, Danny Gokey. And Danny Gokey has a new song out, says, haven't seen it yet. And some of the choruses and the, and the verses in the song are this. You've been pouring out your heart for so many years. You've been hoping that things would change by now. You've cried all the faith you have through so many tears. Don't forget the things he's done before. And remember, he can do them once more. It's like the brightest sunrise waiting on the other side of the darkest night. Don't ever lose hope. Hold on and believe. Maybe you just haven't seen it yet. You just haven't seen it yet. You're closer than you think you are, only moments from the break of dawn. All his promises are just up ahead. Maybe you just haven't seen it. You just haven't seen it yet. Church, Scripture tells us and God's Word reminds us that guaranteed we win. And I think maybe Mr. Gokey took the words of Mr. Paul, the apostle, from Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28 through 39. Read the Scriptures with me, please. Let's read the verse 28 and 29. Familiar Scripture, Romans 8, 28 says this, For we know that all things work together for the good, for those who, who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Church, these verses, they're reminding us there is hope on the way. It's just around the corner. 
the brightest sunrise is just preparing to dawn after the darkest of the night. Wait for it. You haven't seen it yet. It's there. It's coming. All the things in this world, church, understand they work by God's design. Do not lose hope. If there's one thing you can hold on through what Paul is telling us this morning is hold on to the truth. Don't forget the truth that God has designed everything by his plan and his good purpose. Before the world began, he pre designed all things to work by his plan. Church, you realize this, and I come to this by no small conclusion. You go through the book of Proverbs, read all the instructions that Solomon was telling his son and his children's children, and all those who would read the Proverbs. There is a design that God has for our lives, and I will tell you this morning that even when the lost apply God's word to their lives, they will have success. Let me ask you this. When I live my life by kingdom principles, is there blessing and success as a believer? Yes, there is. Because God's spirit is working within us. He has promised this in his word. But let me ask you this much. When a lost person runs their marriage by God principles, is there a promise in that marriage for them? Yes. God's design and his principles work. Pastor, even at the lost? Aren't they taking, stealing something away from God? No. They are just following in God's design. God has designed marriage to work best when it's implemented and when it's walked in in the characteristics of sacrificial, selfless love, not selfish love. When a lost person in their family with their children put into exercise what Paul says, you know, children obey your parents. Fathers do not drive your children to anger. Do those principles work when we put them into effect in our lives? Overwhelmingly, church, yes. God has a design for it. He has a plan and he has a purpose for it. And Paul was reminding us the world is designed to work. It's when we get in the way, it stops working. When we get in the way of God's plan and we say no, God, and we say yes to the flesh, Paul mentioned that earlier in chapter 8, did he not? Don't give way to the flesh. You are no longer under the flesh, but instead walk by, follow, live your life in the spirit. See how it's all coming together, church. When we walk by God's design, there is his blessing in our lives. And guaranteed, guaranteed, even the lost person, pastor, yes, guaranteed. My hope and my desire is to take someone who is putting these things into action in their life and finish the story for them. Paul goes on in, in chapter 9 of Romans to talk about Israel. He says, gosh, they are doing these things. They've got it down. They have the ancestors. They have, you know, the prophets of old, but they're missing Christ. Church, understand our works are not good enough to gain heaven. But there are principles in this life that will work in anyone's life when they put them into action. God has a design for it. We are designed to work. We have been destined. Paul here says those who he knew he predestined, he predesigned to be like who? Jesus. That's the design that God has for all believers. 
is that we start to look like Christ. Not only do all things work together for good, but God has designed good for those he calls. God has designed good for those he calls. Look at this, verse 30. Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about this? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? The church, let's get back into this verse and let's take it apart piece by piece at a time. Remember, we have to take the entire context of this chapter all together. Now, we're getting into kind of a sticky area in, in, in Christendom when we talk about this idea of predestination, do we not? Church, I hope that this morning that God's word is going to free us up to flow with this a little easier, to not make it such a sticking point. Church, ultimately, in the end, God is sovereign. God will do what God designs to do. He has authority. He has the glory in it all, and we are going to submit ourselves to him forever and ever in eternity. Amen. But in that, we understand that God is a good God. He is always good. He may not be convenient. He may not be comfortable. He may not be safe, but he is always, always good. Paul reminds us, even from the first part of Romans, we are not under the law, correct? We don't have to live in this state of anguish and fear that we're not getting it right. We don't have to live with, with uh, the, the fear of condemnation and going, well, if, if my good works don't outweigh all my bad works, and boy, I've got one place I'm going, that's the bad place, the hot place. Church, that's not the way it is. I love the one line in the song it says that says, it says, even in your worst times, God sees you at your best. You know what? I misunderstood that line when, he, when I first heard it this morning. Instead, I heard this. I heard, he is at his best when you are at your worst. Church, that's biblical as well. What does God say in 2 Corinthians 12 in verse 10? For when I am weak, then I'm strong. But even at your worst, God sees your best. We do not live in fear of the law. Christ fulfilled every single requirement of the law, every last letter, every last quotation, every last period. It's done by Jesus. We are all adopted, and we can now call God Abba, Father, means Papa. The most endearing term that a child could call their, their parent, their father, that is now our relationship with God. God is no longer judge. We can walk in and we can sit on his lap. We could come up next to him and say, God, help me, please. And he responds by saying, my child, I'm with you. Paul again reminds us here in chapter 8, you are of the spirit and not of the flesh. Last week we talked about our present sufferings not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in Christ, in us. The church, think about all of this now. Bring this all together in what Paul is saying. All of this is by God's design. He laid out a solid foundation before the world began. It starts with God, goes through God, and it ends up with God. Every single bit of it. Those who have been predestined, they predestined to be like Christ. The mold has been set. 
God is working us and pressing us and shaping us and making us more like Jesus Christ. Sometimes for some, it's a longer process. Sometimes for some, it's a more difficult process. Sometimes some even take their hands out of God's hands and say, no, God, you're not doing it right. I'm going to do it. Pray for your brothers and sisters when they're in that situation. But God designed the process to be finished in your life, to go through the whole thing. Let's look at it. Those who predestined, he called. He called us to be like Christ. And those he called, he justified. He made us right with God, just as if we had never sinned. And those he justified, we will and we already have received glory before God. Church, you see the process here. You see God's plan and God's hand. God loves us so much, he's not going to make us walk through the mud and the mire alone. He has got a reason why we go through the things we're going through. And ultimately, it's so that he can receive all the glory as we are being made in the image of Jesus. Verse 33, look at this. Let's keep going. This is the best part, church. Look at this. Who can bring an accusation against God elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died. But even more has been raised. He also is the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword? As it is written, because of you are being put to death all day long, we are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Church, I see a, a bit of a law coming back into effect here, okay? Track with me, church, as we, as we talk about this and we're looking at this. We know that for, since the beginning of the formation of faith, God has given us the law. We, Paul laid it out. He said the law was given to us to show us who God is and who we are. We are at a deficit because of the law, because we realize that we cannot follow the law, we cannot hold to the law. The best we can do is when we realize we have broken the law, we have to come and make a sacrifice. Old Testament. This even too was part of God's design. Remember what Paul said? He said, well, since I sin and it, it glorifies God, should I not keep on sinning? Absolutely not. I'm going to take it and put it into a Pastor David phrase. Are you kidding me? No. Don't do that. There are three legal issues that are going on here. Church, look at this. We get hints of the law again. First of all, who can possibly prosecute you for anything? Verse 33, look at this again. Who can bring an accusation against you, God's elect? There's the first part of that legal aspect again. If you want to bring the law back into it again, let's bring it back in. Question, who can accuse you now? Nobody. God is the one who has justified you. Church, you are innocent. No one can bring an accusation against you. Who will pass judgment on you if these allegations stick? Who is it that passes judgment on you? Look at again, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? In a court of law, you've got the accusations, you have the judgment. Who is it that judges you? Who condemns you? Jesus Christ is the one who died for you. So the answer is, again, nobody. God is not going to condemn you because he, even here, look at this church, look at the language. He raised Christ up from the dead. 
and seated him at the right hand of God and Christ intercedes for us. No one condemns you. God doesn't even condemn you. Church, is there anyone greater in this world than God? So if God doesn't condemn you, why are you condemning yourself? Why are you letting other people condemn you? Church, I've been there. I struggle, I war with the flesh and the spirit. It's a real thing. You're not a human being if you're not struggling with the two. But I choose to follow the spirit and I want to starve the flesh so that I may glorify God. What comes after the sentence of judgment? The execution of the punishment, correct? Verse 35, what happens when your punishment is executed in a trial and you are taken away, you are incarcerated? What has happened to you? You've been separated, have you not? Paul says here, he finishes out, who can separate us from the love of God? Church, you know the answer. Let me give you some possible candidates here, okay? Can affliction, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword? Can any of these things bring an accusation, judge, or condemn you and separate you from God? Not a single one. Not a single one. Far from weakening the bonds of love, trouble and hardship strengthen them. This is by Robert Mounts. Persecution drives the true believer into the arms of the one who fully knows our suffering. Famine and nakedness are powerless to affect the love of Christ. Danger and the sword, even that of the executioner, lose their terror in view of the presence of the one in whom we find ultimate safety. Church, are you, are you terrified sometimes when darkness falls? Are you afraid of, of the night? Sometimes that spiritual darkness that seems to be all around us in this world. Nothing can separate you from the love that is in Christ. He paid for it with his blood. God didn't even spare Jesus to pay. God's love guarantees that nothing can separate us from God. Look at this, church, 37 through 39. No, there's the answer. Can famine, hardship, danger, persecution, the sword, can any of those things separate us from the love of God? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor any power nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation nor any other created thing. Paul talks to us about the things that are in this world that we can see, the sword, persecution, affliction, those things are in the physical world. Now he says, okay, let's put the crowning cap on everything. There is nothing else in all creation that can separate you from Christ. Not angels, not demons, not the future, not the present or the past. The physical world can't separate you. Those things seen, the spiritual world, those things cannot separate you. And let me just give it to you so that there is no doubt, nothing else in all creation. Is there anything in this world that has not been created? No, because it wouldn't be in the world. They cannot separate us from the love of God as in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'd like to ask for our deacons to come down at this time. We're going to prepare for the Lord's Supper. 
And church, I want us to do something a little different right now as the, as the message time is finishing out. I want us to celebrate the fact that God has guaranteed that we win. We're going to celebrate that fact. We're going to proclaim Christ's death. And we're going to celebrate that till he comes. But we're going to celebrate the fact that we are going to celebrate in this feast, remembering the feast that is to come and remembering the fact that we are guaranteed to win. Church, we are guaranteed to win. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. 38 and 39 of Romans 8 demonstrate the spiritual aspect of it. Church, there is a guarantee the best is yet to come. Nothing in the invisible or the invisible realm or anything you can imagine. You have God's guarantee on it through Christ. Deacons, go ahead, please take the elements. Go ahead and start to disperse them among, among our, our members, please. The law does not separate us. Absolutely nothing else can. God's love guarantees it. Church, God's love guarantees it. Listen to this. He had the solution before you had a problem. He sees the best in you when you feel at your worst. So in the questioning, don't ever doubt his love for you. Because it's only in his love that you'll find a breakthrough. He's moving with a love so deep. Hallelujah for the victory. Good things are coming even when you can't see them. Even when we can't see them yet. Church, this morning, I want us to take and partake of this Lord's Supper and remembering that God has given us victory in Christ. And despite what you're going through, despite the things that are difficult at this time, church, I do not wish to diminish any of them. What I want to encourage you with this morning is hold on. Hold on. Don't give up. And church, I even believe the victory is coming even in this life as well. Your Christian life, your spiritual life is not meant to be a, a giant backpack on the back of you to see how much you can carry and how much you can keep from getting crushed before you get to heaven. Church, if that was the case, Jesus would never have said, give me your burdens and take mine upon yourself. Christ said, my load is easy, my burdens are light. Make that exchange. Make that trade. Deacons, come on back down again. If we've already served, let's go ahead and come on down. Have you experienced that victory in your life? Church, the fullness of it is not here yet. We just haven't seen it yet. But guaranteed, guaranteed it's coming. Reverend Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the offering. Thank you for all the folks that are here today, Father. I ask you the blessing on our thing that we're doing today, Father, that 
It is a blessing to each and every one of us, Father. Just forgive us where you failed you. And all this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, on the night that our Lord was to be crucified, the Bible says he took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, Scripture says, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples. He says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat this meal and you drink of this cup, you celebrate my death. And this morning we remember that Christ is coming again. We have been guaranteed the victory. We haven't seen it yet, but it is ours in Christ Jesus. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Scripture says that likewise, after they celebrated this meal, that they sung a hymn, then they went out. At this time, church, let's sing. Let's remember what God has done for us in Christ, giving him praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Try. 